Uh, I'm going to turn it You're on to uh, Sam. Thank you, and, Ted. Uh, let, let him go with the grain storage. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, sound check. Edwin, can you hear me all right? Well, <clears throat> good morning. Appreciate being on the program today, and um, glad you all don't have the snow that we did in, in Paducah yesterday. Um, and the roads were clear all the way up, so I was glad, glad to see that. Um, as Tad said, I'm an extension agricultural engineer. I've worked with grain storage my entire career at Princeton. Um, I'll show you a little bit about uh, kind of want to give you some slides and show you some of the things we've been going through there, but from there launching to the topic. Um, so we um, started in 79 at Princeton, and we moved into the core area of this, of this building, which is kind of bounded by the footprint you see in the middle of the building. Okay? We moved into that building in, 19, in August of 1980, and um, things were cooking along. We decided to expand that, and we expanded the staff uh, and the faculty there and have some new folks coming on. Uh, some of on the, them were, they were on the program today as well with me. We ex, uh, and, the, and they remodeled it and uh, took a couple of years to remodel it. Stayed in the building and worked around a little bit. <clears throat> we added an office wing on the north end, uh, remodeled the conference area on the west uh, side, and then we added a couple of labs on the east side of the, of the building. Um, and that's what it looked like on the December the 10th, 2021. And, and, and that's what it looked like the morning of the December 11th. So uh, we were fortunate there was no, it had happened at night, uh, there was no loss of life in Princeton or in, in well, not just at the station, but also in, in the area, in our area there at Princeton. Uh, unlike Mayfield and um, Dawson Springs, who had a lot more damage in, in their towns. But uh, it was very devastating. We are uh, recovering from that, obviously. Uh, you see some of the barns we had in the background there. Um, and just to show you some of the things we've been, we've been dealing with. But right now, we have some temporary offices there at the station. These are located as you drive into the where used to, the office building used to be. And these are just single wide trailers that are lashed together and bolted together and made an office space out of those. And so we're getting along. And as you'll see in some of the research that's being presented after me today, that uh, the research has continued. Uh, uh, our, our folks have been very, very resilient uh, through this or, ordeal. And uh, we've, been, we've been blessed to have, uh, oh, I think, support of the ag faculty as, as well as the support of campus, the community, uh, commodity groups all across the board. Uh, we are coming back. And then we will eventually build back much like what we had uh, within a couple of years. So I invite you folks to come down for some of our events, uh, field days as they, as they occur. Uh, we're still a little bit um, trying to work through some details uh, logistics and that kind of thing because we don't have all the infrastructure that we did before. But I wanted to just kind of give you that little bit of background um, just because I guess the place has been near and dear to me for 40 plus years. Um, but getting into the topic, and I think, uh, try to stay on time. I have a lot of slides. I'll be glad to, to share the, the PowerPoint or the, the, uh, the printout of these with you. Uh, Phillips already asked for that. I'll be glad to share it with him. Uh, and other agents that are here today. <clears throat> but I want to kind of show you what the grain storage situation has been like and how the grain storage capacity has grown in Kentucky and, and how we're unique a little bit from other states. Uh, what's interesting in Kentucky, what I'm showing here is that the blue line is on-farm storage over the years, going back to um, this 2020, 2003, actually. And, it, and it, of course, if you go further in history, uh, those numbers were... Uh, we've seen a lot of growth uh, up to that point. Uh, but over the years, most of the growth has actually been on farm across the state. There have been some years we've, we've put on as much as 5 million, we've added as much as 5 million bushels in a given year. And uh, there's a lot of management, uh, of course, that goes along with that. We have a lot of investment represented in the value of the grain in those bins, and we want to manage that well. So that's the thing we want to talk about today. Uh, there's been some years that we've been kind of stagnant. We didn't have a lot of growth. But where we are now is around 350 million bushels capacity total. Uh, the, uh, the red line there is what we're seeing at elevators, uh, commercial operations, and those aren't, haven't been growing at the same rate as on farm storage. So that's 
we've had a lot of work to do in storage area. Before you store it, you have to dry it. Um, maybe it's dried in the field before you bring it in, in which case you might want to just run some air through it to control the temperature during the storage period. Okay? <clears throat> we call that a natural air system, where you would just control the temperature of it. Uh, if you run the fan long enough at a high enough airflow rate, and we'll talk about airflow rates, we'll talk about some software that's available to help you design fans for different applications uh, when, when you're conditioning grain, either drying or just storing it. But at a low temperature or natural air system, you just have a fan, maybe a small heater on it, to bump a little heat at night, keep the humidity down, and keep the drying process going. That's the lowest cost system that's out there. We'll take a look at some energy requirements for those different systems uh, as we go along here in the next couple of slides. But uh, those are the lowest capacity, obviously. And there's some limitations on the size of bins that you can have to, uh, uh, to provide a natural air drying operation because just the physics involved. You can't push enough air through when you get a full large bin. We'll take a look at that too, we'll go along. High temperature bin dryers add a little bit of capacity right here. What we're seeing, this is in Ohio County. Uh, the drying bin is actually there in the center, and it, as the grain is dried, it's unloaded from the bottom and then transported to adjacent bins. That's a higher capacity system, a little more injury required, but a lot more. Um, you can dry a batch a day, whereas with the low temperature systems, you're talking about several weeks to push that drying front all the way through the grain. And then as we as we step up the capacity here, the automatic batch dryers, standalone cross flow type dryers. And again, um, you'll see those displayed at the Farm Machinery Show next or later this month. And uh, all these, many of the vendors that I'm going to talk about today will be at that show and we'll be glad to talk to you if you have interest in uh, their, hearing their side on what they have available, what the features that they have available for different uh, manufacturers. Uh oh, maybe I just carried that one. I didn't know I have a very good clip on it. Um, but then the largest capacity system we have would be a continuous flow dryer shown in the bottom right. Okay? It's, um, it's actually a tower dryer you see here in the middle of the system. And uh, grain is coming in off the field, placed in these wet holding tanks for a little surge capacity as it's coming out of the field. And this is one reason we want to have storage to start with is so we can keep the combines running. And we want to uh, back things up in the farm. Uh, and somewhat the capacity of all these different systems depends on the harvesting rate for your farm. Now you would select those, now you go forward, and then how you expand from them. Uh, one other thing I've been doing uh, recently is to work with uh, folks that may want to swap out some of their dryers to a more efficient system. The uh, Rural Energy for America program has, um, some, has some grant money available to uh, help folks do that if they can show us energy savings. Okay? Um, one thing I run into a lot is, well, uh, folks have a natural air system, they, they want a high capacity dryer. Well, there's no energy savings there because uh, you have a lot, you're burning a lot of gas in these high capacity systems, whereas in a natural air system there's no gas consumption at all. So we'll take a look at the next slide then on some of the energy consumption and here what their capacity range might be considered. So natural air systems, again, low temperature systems, low capacity, uh, just a few thousand bushels uh, a day, depending on the diameter of the bin. Lar low temperature systems where we're trickling in maybe one, three to 10 degrees of heat. And again, a lot of that might be at just at night, so we can keep the humidity low and keep the drying process going. Uh, that might be a couple thousand bushels a day, but we can take a little more moisture out of it, so a more capacity there. It's a little higher energy required for that. So we're going to have, we're going to bump up the energy from maybe a couple of degrees to maybe up as many as 20 degrees. A 20 degree rise will reduce the humidity by a half. So it gives you a lot more drying capacity. Okay. As we go on down the table here, high temperature in bin systems, here shown on the left, uh, have a lot more capacity. You can, again, these are about dried in batches. You might have two or three batches depending on the um, size of the operation or the other system I was showing there in Ohio County where the, the, the grain is actually unloaded off the bottom of the bin as it's dried. Okay. And, uh, and it gives you, a, that's, an, that's a, it's kind of a good transition from a natural air system to a, to a high temperature system bin dryer because you can just add the additional equipment to make that happen. 
uh, and you've already got the shell paid for. Automatic batch, continuous slow dryers, the lowest uh, bottom two rows here were showing, obviously, a lot more capacity, uh, a lot more airflow, higher temperatures. Uh, we can dry anywhere from 40, up to 40,000 bushels a day. Um, we used to say when I started uh, this job, we would, you know, 10,000 bushels a day was a good day at corn, right? Uh, and since yields have been increasing, combines are getting bigger, uh, capacities, there's more demand on capacity for dryers. I don't know that we'd have that uh, so much in this part of the state, but um, some of the larger farms in western Kentucky, where they're running a couple of two or three different combines, they actually do have that demand on their system. So that's possible. You know. And they didn't start out that way. They started out uh, with these lower temperature systems, smaller capacity systems. So these are some energy costs, and I'm not going to go through a lot of detail for the sake of time here, but uh, just a bottom line, uh, looking at cents cost per bushel uh, at $2 gas is probably not that high right now. 12 cent electricity, which is probably about right for most of the state based on some energy audits I've done. Uh, if you're just drying five points, uh, it's going to cost you about 15 cents or three cents a point, roughly, uh, for a natural air system just to run the fan. Okay, so that takes a lot of hours to get the job done. And then uh, as you go down to the table here, comparison to a high temperature cross flow with a, with a heat recovery system on it, um, it'd be about 14 cents without the heat recovery, about 23 cents, or about a little over five and a half cents a point. Okay. Again, that's a $2 gas. So from there, I think, you know, we, we, I definitely want to cover some of the drying, some of the options, some of the choices, some of the systems that are out there for drying before we launch into a storage discussion because timely drying is, uh, is very critical for it to store well, as you know. But uh, from here, we want to talk about, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Elevator. For having the moisture, it's, it's, it can, there's two or three different moisture, uh, moisture discount schedules that are used. Um, it can be a half a, uh, like a nickel of half a point or a dime a point to dry it is, a, is somewhat of a typical charge. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Or uh, a couple of percent of the value of the grain is another discount schedule that's used. So generally, you can dry cheaper on the farm, but it's not as much as, as savings as you might think. Um, over time, if you have a lot of, a lot of grain to, to handle, uh, you can pay for a dryer. Yeah. It's going to take a few years. <laughs> because, uh, and, but you have the convenience, and you don't have the weight in the elevator, and there's some value to that, too. So there's a lot to be considered in that. But um, good question. Thank you. So on the storage side, then, <clears throat> we want to talk about some of the fundamentals. We want to talk about some of the uh, principles that we, that we know work and, uh, to preserve the quality of the grain during storage. You cannot, you cannot improve the quality during storage. You know that. But the best you can hope for is to maintain the quality as it comes in and out of the field. Okay? And how do you manage that? Um, one thing we want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to go in more detail, uh, this this uh, acronym we call SLAM, Post Engineer, Post Harvest Engineers, are, are widely use this across the Corn Belt uh, to summarize some of the steps that uh, are proven best management pr practices to reduce uh, pest problems in the, in the stored grain, but it's, it's sanitation, loading, aeration, and monitoring. A lot of tools out there available for monitoring and take some of the drudgery out of uh, and some of the guesswork out of monitoring stored grain. But again, you have a lot of um, a lot of investment represented in the value of the grain in the end bin. So it's, it, uh, I think uh, it's interesting to see some of the things that have come out. And we'll talk about those. And then I want to close out with some some resources that, are, that I found and share with you all uh, that for for sizing fans, for maybe uh, evaluating economics, and also for um, some of the things you might, you might want to look at. If you happen to go to the machinery show and some, talk to some of the vendors that make some of the equipment that I will talk about here. So grain storage 101, uh, the five factors or four factors that, in, that um, impact storability of grain 
The number one is moisture content. We'll, we'll talk, and it depends on the different grains about which is a safe storage for um, and why that is so. The second thing would be temperature. If we cool it, we know we can control insect activity. We'll take a look at where those levels are and how we manage that in Kentucky. Uh, the initial condition of the grain, as you know, uh, if you have a lot of insect damage in the field, we maybe have some mold problems coming in from the field. may want to store that uh, differently, but we certainly want to dry that quickly. Uh, we say within the, the rule of thumb for staying away from aflatoxin problems, for example, is to dry corn with uh, below 16% within 24 hours after it's harvested to get ahead of any any problem that can occur when grain is idle, sitting in a, in a, in a tank or a truck where those more mold spores can really flourish. Uh, then, then the last thing here is oxygen availability, and that's where grain bags come in because it's you're going to have, and there's pluses and minuses with, it, with that system, but uh, the, the bottom line is if you restrict the amount of oxygen that's available in, in the environment, you'll control insect activity and you'll control mold activity. Uh, grain bags are, I, I call them semi-hermetic because <laughs> they do limit the amount of oxygen transfer. It's not like a grain bin where you're going to push air through it because you really can't push air through a, a grain bag, uh, realistically. Um, so there's a, a wide range of systems that are out there to control uh, and do a good job of storing grain in a hermetic container. But uh, it doesn't really apply to bulk grain, certainly not in the U.S. It's more, more for smaller um, systems, uh, and I've seen it happen, but they use them widely in Africa, for example, but uh, not so much here. But <clears throat> to kind of get a little deeper in the conversation, the allowable storage time for corn, and it gets, it gets back to some of the biological activities, some of the, uh, I mean, the mole spores are there on the surface of the grain, and when you bring it from the field, it's just a matter, they're looking for an opportunity to, uh, to grow and flourish. But if we can prevent that, uh, we'll, we'll control them. Uh, but as you can see, typically what we'll see in, in this fall of the year at harvest time, uh, maybe starting to harvest in the low 20s, mid 20s of moisture for corn, uh, we don't really have a lot of time. Uh, we have a matter of a few days. And if you have some of those low temperature drying systems, then uh, it could cause some problems in the top of the bin where it's going to be the last to dry. Okay? So you want to be sure that you stay ahead of uh, the the uh, figures that are shown here in the table where you might have just a few days you want to for example if you have 20 percent corn coming in at 70 degrees which is a typical it's the average monthly temperature for September when you have about uh, 16 days to get it dried to 16 percent before you start to lose half a grade of uh, half a percent of dry matter loss that's the threshold for this table okay so that's a guideline to get started and help you guide um, and control harvest, the harvesting schedule. And you can see, as you go from, from right to left on the columns of the table, if a 10 degree drop in temperature will about double the storage time for, for corn. And that's true of most any grain. But a similar table for soybeans is quite different in the sense that soybeans, because of the high respiration, uh, high oil crop, uh, you can really count on about 2 to 3 percent lower uh, moisture, moisture level to have the same allowable storage time. Okay? But again, from right to left, you see a doubling of the storage time with a 10 degree drop in temperature. So these are some, again, guidelines for helping you schedule harvest time to stay away of any, stay ahead of any problems. Because as you know, uh, moisture discounts at the elevator. Uh, can be substantial, and they can get into um, they can get your pocketbook if you have excess insects, and in sometimes you might get the load rejected. I've, I've heard of that happening, of course, uh, either from insects or moles problems, and the grain is coming in. So we want to stay away from those problems, obviously, or even even to avoid these discounts that you can that can you can hit with if um, if it's not in good condition coming out of the bin. Say if bin in the, in the you're holding it into the springtime, and you want to try to get it out of there before insects start flourishing. <clears throat> but part of the discussion is knowing uh, the equilibrium moisture content of different grains. 
So equilibrium moisture is the level of moisture that grain will rest, come to rest after it's been a long exposure to the, to the air conditions that are shown here. Okay? For example, and there's two different things I want to point out here on the table. Um, and this is, this is really an important uh, property of, of grain and what, it, what guides the storage guidelines and recommendations going forward. So we know that uh, molds like moisture, as it turns out, anything above 65% humidity inside a grain bin can be a problem area. Okay? So to the right of that column on the table would be at risk. Grain in that condition would be at risk for losing dry matter loss just because of the mold activity that would be uh, likely and probable in that condition. And of course, they like, they like a warmer environment, uh, as do insects. But now if we can control the temperature below 60 degrees, we'll control insect activity. Okay? So that's, that's the areas, those are the bounds within the table that show, um, illustrate what would be considered safe storage conditions for corn. Okay? And what I've done in the next couple of slides is, is to look at, just to kind of isolate these columns between 60, 65, and 70. But first we want to look at soybeans. <clears throat> but these tables are available through um, uh, our professional organization, American Society of Agricultural Biological Engineers. And uh, I've got some tools that are available that where you can plug in a temperature and um, humidity for the, the time that you'll be running the fan, and it'll predict what the equilibrium moisture will be for those conditions. Okay? But it'll be from a table like this. So for corn, well, here again, we've isolated those columns on the graph. In the wintertime in Kentucky, our, this time of year, our average monthly temperature is about 35 degrees. Okay? You want to keep the grain temperature within about 10 to 15 degrees of the air temperature, the monthly air temperature. Well, in, in the summertime, the temperature gets up to about 80, July and August, the monthly average temperature. So in, in the summer, safe storage condition for corn would be at about 13%, again, to keep it dry enough inside that bin where we would control mold activity and any mycotoxins that might develop from that. If we're above that line, we are somewhat at risk, 70% humidity and higher. Okay. Whereas in the wintertime, we can hold it at about 15.5%. So, and that's more, of a, more widely used as a marketing moisture. Okay. So that, this is where somewhat the storage piece, there's some economic implications that we'll talk about that. <clears throat> In comparison with soybeans, as again, because of the high oil content in soybeans, high respiration rate, lower safe moistures, uh, wintertime is about 13%, but in the summer, it's more like about uh, 11 and a half or 12 for it to store well and, and avoid any mold problems in storage in the summer. Okay. <clears throat> On the website, <clears throat> I've got a tool where you can just plug in the temperature and, and humidity Again, what I would suggest is that you look at a weather forecast and see what the average temperature might be. We've got a tool. I'll talk about a tool that's available to, uh, and we'll look at maysville conditions here. But there's 16 grains that, um, <clears throat> that, that have been or might be grown in Kentucky, and I tried to cover all of those in the tool. You can just plug in those, those two values, and it'll calculate the uh, equilibrium moisture content for those conditions. Or you can use a table just as easily if you have tables for all 16 grains. Those are available, but they're not usually found, so that's why I developed this. But uh, that's one tool for you. So Clemson University has developed um, some information from this, tying the equilibrium conditions with uh, a five-day weather forecast. And it's very useful for, for drying, for starters, but also during aeration when you're trying to <clears throat> see what the trend might be in a five-day period. What the calculator does is it gives you the instantaneous moisture for a, for a given uh, combination of temperature and humidity. Okay? It calculates what the, what the equilibrium moisture is. And it doesn't, it doesn't change that fast. 
It takes several days for grain to be exposed to the air conditions for it to reach that level. So what I've done is, I've, uh, again, this is looking at um, current weather in Maysville, the temperature humidity range. <clears throat> See, we have a little bit of a drying trend. The humidity is shown in the green here and temperature in, in the blue. A little bit of a warming trend and a drying trend for this period. Okay. Well, that would tell you then that uh, certainly for corn and beans, we're going to have we, we were going to run the fan during that period. We would see a little bit of a change, a lowering of moisture in the zone that's first exposed to that air. Okay. Generally, uh, you wouldn't see much more than a quarter point of moisture change for the amount of in a five-day period, and it would just be at that level where the air is, has most exposure to the grain. It wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be a change throughout the bin because it doesn't happen that fast. But what I like about the tool is it does show you some trends. And um, if you need to moisten grain, if it's been overdried coming in and out of the field, for example, and there's some economic incentive to do that. We'll talk about that next. <clears throat> Corn is $6, beans at 13 Looking at the bottom row there. We talked about drying it past the market level, a, a point or two, just to have safe storage. It's going to cost you some money, a little bit of money to do that, just in weight loss. This is just weight loss. This is not energy associated around the fans. This is just the weight loss from selling grain a point or two below the market level. Market level for corn I, could be 15 and a half, could be 14, depending on your market, could be 15, kind of an average number I'm using here. <coughs> Wheat and beans, most... Um, oh, Pretty common, the same across the state for all buyers at 13 and a half for wheat, 13 for beans. Uh, but if you're drying it, if you're coming in out of the field at 12%, which is not unheard of as, as dry weather we had, and I've heard of moisture as low as 9% for beans last fall. <coughs> we will be off this table, but if it's just a, a, point, a point blow for soybeans, at thirteen dollars, you're going to lose fourteen cents a bushel. If it's coming in at eleven percent, you're going to lose thirty cents a bushel just on the weight loss. So there's some there's some value in controlling the moisture levels. What I'm really getting at here, you want it to be kind of like, kind of like the the fairy tale, I guess. You don't you don't want it too too hot, too cold. You don't want it too much too wet, and you don't want it too dry. You want to try to target. There's some really some economic incentive. Is what I'm getting at here to really try to measure and, and, and know what your moisture levels are and then try to control those as closely to the market level as you can. There are some tools to help you do that, and that's what we want to talk about. Okay. <clears throat> but to control some of the risk of storage, fairly common list. You, you've seen this before, I'm sure, but you want to check the moisture going into storage. You know that tells you how long you have to store the grain, um, how you want to manage it, perhaps. If you want to sort it, different bins. Uh, it's a good idea to m minimize the amount of broken material because that impedes airflow. And it, any, any, corns that, any kernels that are broken have a lot of exposure to insects and mold spores, so they're more susceptible to damage. Uh, it may be a good idea to screen grain for mycotoxins, especially if you're, selling, if you're feeding it or if you're selling it to a neighbor that is feeding it. Uh, they won't, may want to know what the quality of the grain is coming out of the storage or going in to start with. Good idea to clean the grain and remove the fine material because it will get better airflow in the bin. And then the last point here is to, to monitor it with or manage it with the, the SLAM. Uh, it's described as a SLAM acronym that stands for Sanitation, Loading, Aeration, and Monitoring. Okay? On the sanitation piece, it involves all equipment that a grain will come in contact as it moves in the field to the bin. So uh, the dryers, uh, augers, bucket elevator, boots, those can be a source, source of uh, insect infestation if they're not cleaned, cleaned well between crops. Certainly the dryers and the, or the bins themselves. And I'm talking about uh, getting in there with a, a wet dry vac, not just a broom and a, and a dustpan, but really get them clean. Before you have it, so you don't have any debris in there at all. You need to knock down any spoiled grain off the wall so it won't contaminate the incoming crop. Okay, get them clean. In terms of uh, loading, we want to uh, try to core the bin after it's been filled. If it's a smaller bin, 
If it's a larger bin, it's a good idea to core the grain. And what I'm talking about is remove, removing a, just, uh, a center core of, of material in the center that, where it tends to accumulate fines and trash as it's loaded. Typically get a high concentration of fines in that spot when that's going to, the air is not going to be able to penetrate in that area. It's going to take a lot longer for the air to get through that area than if it's um, uniform. So you can kind of compensate that by coring the, the bin to remove that, that concentration, of that area where the fines are concentrated. Okay. So it's a case where that wasn't done, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, so the air bypassed the core, and over time, I mean, it sat there kind of unnoticed for several months, and it developed a, a, uh, just a chunk of grain that blocked the flow, and then we have other problems, safety problems associated with that. But we also have some small grain here, obviously. This is not um, a particularly large bin. This is about a 24-foot um, 20, diameter bin that was not far from the station <coughs> where they had a, actually had a rescue operation. It was uh, a fellow got trapped in a bin, and this was the root of the cause of the problem was it blocked the flow. And he, when he got in to, to try to, to uh, break that up, he didn't know that there was such a mass. And all he saw it when he first went in was just the tip of it. But um, that story was uh, as easy to tell because um, after he was taken to the hospital and checked out, you know, he was back home having dinner with his family that evening. So uh, it was one of those, one of those cases where um, they don't all turn out that well. We'll take a look at some data that's been collected on entrapments. But um, when we talk about aeration, <clears throat> we need to keep in mind that it takes some time for that push for the cooling front to, to move completely through the grain bin, and it depends on the size of the bin, the size of the fan, that combination. A rule of thumb for, for aeration time is to divide 15 by the airflow rate in CFM per bushel. And we talk about it, there's a program available to help you know what those levels are. But we consider a minimum rate of aeration of a tenth of a CFM per bushel. At that rate, it's going to take about 150 hours, about six days, to, to push that cooling front all the way from the pot, bottom to the top, to completely cool it out. Conversely, if you have a, a one horse or a one CFM per bushel, uh, maybe a 10 horse fan on a 10,000 bushel band, for example, it's only going to take you 15 hours to cool that, to push that cooling front through. So, how you manage the fair fan aeration and operating times depends a lot on the size of the fan. And there's some uh, ways to control it automatically. Uh, if you, well, those options are available, and we'll talk about that too, going forward. I do want to mention uh, the goals of our temperature, what we consider uh, the targets for Kentucky. So the line on the graph shows the average monthly temperature from this is July and then into uh, January and then back in August, July period. <coughs> And when we would want to operate our fans to cool it out in the fall, and we want to try to, to cool it down about 10 degrees a month, basically. Mother Nature generally gives us those opportunities, uh, not always the same time uh, year to year, but in time, during that period, you'll have an opportunity to cool grain about 10 degrees a month. And it's a good idea to do it that way as opposed to trying to, you know, if you've got grain at 70 degrees and you kind of forget about it and you say, well, you know, wait a minute, it's uh, 50 degrees out there in, in November. You wait that long and push it, try to push it through, you're going to get a lot of condensation on the roof of the bin because just that you're pushing warm, moist air against a cold surface. And what happens in that case is that you'll get roof drip and it'll come down the walls and it'll, you'll obviously, a lot of times you'll get a, a crusted ring of grain in the top of the bin. Okay? You want to be sure you have enough um, roof vents and you have good airflow in the headspace to get that moist, uh, humid air out of the bin so it doesn't trap, it's not trapped in there where, where it can cause a problem, where it gets condensation. So again, cooling it about 10 degrees a month will help you avoid that and being sure you have good uh, circulation in the headspace. Air vents or just a gap between that top ring and the roof. And then after it's cooled out, you want to seal the fan with, with a tarp or piece of plywood or a metal sheet just to kind of keep any wind-driven air currents from getting back in 
and rewarming the grain. You want to hold it cool into the spring. A program I like to use out of Minnesota will help you um, determine what airflow rates you might have for your for the bins on the farm. And all you need to know there is the, the diameter of the bin, uh, the make and model of the fan, because they've got a library of 400 fans. Any fan that's made on the market, available on the market, is in their database. They can match those up. We'll look at an example in a minute, but then it gives you the capacity of the bin in three foot increments, how much airflow you're getting in those three foot increments throughout the bin. This is just a, excuse me, a screenshot of the, of the program, and I want to show you an example of a 50,000 bushel bin, which at, across this corn belt, that's about the average size that's sold these days. Is a 50,000 bushel bin. You can put any size bin you want in there. I know it's much larger than what might have we might have in this area, but belt wide, it's it's about a, it's a it's a fairly popular size. Well, we're going to aerate corn, and uh, at about a half a CFM per bushel, because I want to try to do that quickly, just to compare that, see what it would take. The program estimated it would take 30 horsepower, excuse me, a total of 30 horsepower fan capacity to get that airflow rate through there. So I chose two 15 horse fans and it'd be running in parallel. So the outcome of the uh, the program was to show that again for different for three foot increments of depth, how much capacity you have in the bin, how much airflow that fan can deliver, those two fans can deliver. Again, those are two 15 horse centrifugal fans because we had a lot of static pressure in this situation because we have 33 feet of depth. Um, but what that airflow rate is as you um, fill the bin it certainly falls off, but that's due to the static pressure, which is shown in the last column there. But bottom line is, uh, with that matchup, it predicts we'll get a half a CFM per bushel when the bin is full. And so at that rate, it would only um, take about 30 hours of fan operation to, uh, to do the job in one cycle. On cooling cycle. So then I compared, I did a re-ran the model for different airflow rates, uh, looked at uh, just the cost of this associated with uh, electric electricity running at 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the minimum airflow rate of 10 per bushel would, would take only a three horse fan to get that job done. So it doesn't take a lot of horsepower to do the minimum, it takes a lot of horse horsepower to do a half a CFM per bushel. And again, it's just the, the nature of uh, the of the physics, trying to push that much air through uh, grain that has a fixed amount of resistance. But the cost on it, again, at 12 cents, um, about $162 for whether we're running a tenth of a CFM or a quarter of a CFM, which does take a half, a seven and a half horse motor, okay? Cost-wise, it's less than a penny, a bushel, to cool it out. So it's very economical insect control. Again, this is for three cycles through the fall, to completely cool it out from about uh, 70 degrees down to 30, 35 in three months time period. And um, compare that then with, uh, you know, we're seeing five, just maybe see a nickel or a dime a discount if we have a heavily infested grain coming into the, into the elevator. Thank you, Tad. All right, so moving along quickly, how often do you check the grain? Uh, obviously, you consider the value of it. You want to look at it pretty dang often, or, or invest in some tools to help you do the job. Uh, one tool that's available to you is our temperature cables. Uh, these will be mounted in a bin, and they're going to check the temperature, be able to monitor the temperature. At areas that are deep where you can't really run a probe, uh, there's definitely advantage to running to installing temperature cables, because <clears throat> they can take a lot of drudgery out of the, of the task of monitoring grain. Uh, the newer systems, uh, or electronically uh, d designs where you can actually monitor the situation in a bin with a cell phone, so you don't have to be on site to check the temperature of the, of the grain. And uh, really handy to do that. Uh, there's some limitations with cables. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of air associated with, with uh, grain storage, and that's why we want to talk about these relationships. But air actually, st stagnant air is actually a pretty good insulator. Yeah, you always hear of the bulk grain being a good insulator, but it's actually the air in the grain mass that is the insulator. 
value, <clears throat> and it doesn't really penetrate. I mean, the temperature changes don't spread that fast. If it's very, if, if the temperature, if you say if you were to have a, a hot spot away from the cable, it would take a while for that temperature to find that cable, the, the sensor itself. Okay, so that's one limitation with temperature cables. If if the hot spot is close to the sensor, obviously, then you, you get a an accurate quick read on it, and you know what you need to run the fans, cool it out. A better option uh, is a CO2 monitoring. This is kind of a new concept, but if you're monitoring the CO2 levels in the grain, and you can just monitor it at the exhaust up at the top of the bin, if you start to see it then increase, you'll see a, a CO2 increase before you'll see a temperature increase, more than likely, okay? especially depending on where that hot spot is in relation to the sensor. Okay, <clears throat> but now if you're monitoring that weekly, you see levels starting to come up. You need to know what those thresholds are. If it's below 600 parts per million, uh, then you've got a little going on, but there's nothing that's going to be a half a matter, a half percent of dry matter loss. So it's not a lot of worry with that. But if it keeps on climbing, then you definitely want to to run the aeration fan to cool it out. That doesn't control it, you may need to move the grain to a different bin or just offload it to avoid further damage. So that's that's one thing that, that you might talk to some vendors about if you go to Louisville. Insect monitoring. Uh, there's, uh, again, some of similar kind of regression of tools available. You can do uh, pit traps just as the entomologist shows up. Uh, <laughs> talk about insect monitoring store grain. Uh, so this is, this is a static trap that you would check frequently, uh, weekly, and it has a, <clears throat> it just has a series of holes drilled around the perimeter. As insects move about in grain, they will, they will crawl in and fall into that trap, and then it'll be collected at the cap, as a screw cap at the bottom, and you can check where, what the populations are uh, week to week, and know if, if you need to do anything to treat that. Uh, similarly, there are some electronic devices to do, help you do that job more easily with less drudgery, climbing up and, up and down the ladder of the bin. <clears throat> and then again, um, I'll share some uh, websites that um, with these manufacturers, but OPI has one of the most sophisticated systems where you're actually, again, again you, can, you can monitor this insect activity remotely. Okay? And uh, this is the array of some of the equipment that'll be again at the machinery show. They're not all in one, all in one spot. Unfortunately, you got to you know spend a couple of days to find them all. But um, those those vendors will be there, so you can check pricing. You can check what their latest features are. And I encourage you to do that if you have stored grain. Don't have a lot of time to go into some of the features with all the uh, sensors I'm showing here. Just kind of a quick uh, economic comparison on what these sensors might cost. Uh, I think it's a very good investment because up front, <clears throat> I mean, you're going to call, you'll be out a few thousand dollars, but if you have a lot of bushels to say grace over, uh, it, it works down to a half a cent or maybe as much as 20 cents a bushel. But again, that's per year. And if you can, com, if you compare that with some of the discounts we talked about earlier, uh, it can be a good investment. And it, again, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of monitoring grain. <clears throat> I need to talk a little bit about storage safety. You know, you need to. Work in pairs if you're working in a, if you need to go inside a bin and check the condition, you want to have a respirator for sure, a climbing harness that's, that has a good, strong, secure spot to tie it off to. And again, those, those, that'll be demonstrated at the machinery show as well. When you enter the West Wing, Dale Dodson from the Kentucky Ag Department will have a, a display there to talk about uh, monitoring <clears throat> safety considerations for monitoring stored grain. Uh, a lot of EMS, um, does, do, do your folks in this area have coffer dams in their EMS groups? So those are available. They didn't used to be, but those, that's a newer, newer thing. But um, widely available and, and highly recommended. Uh, so last thing I'll share here is um, some of the data from Purdue University. They do an annual um, check, an annual report on entrapments that have occurred in grain bins across the corn belt. 
or across the country, actually. <clears throat> and you see, most of the most of the incidences, this is, goes back. Their database goes back to '62, and most before many of your time. But uh, <laughs> and these are just the reported incidents. Okay, uh, and then what's shown in the in white here uh, is the 2020 incidents. And again, um, it's just an awareness. Um, well, to, to know, to make folks aware of the dangers involved, and that they obviously have been some deaths associated with grain entrapments. <clears throat> uh, the five-year average, uh, running average here of late, around 30 incidents uh, across the, the country, which is more than it seemed like it ought to be, for sure, especially as, as much as we know about the problem. But uh, it continues to happen. Okay, the very last thing I want to talk about is economics, but now we don't have time to go too deep into it, so I'm doing a, a quick plug for our uh, friends in uh, <clears throat> the Agriculture Economic Department at UK. Uh, Jordan Shockley has uh, been on the board about eight years. He's done some of the work on um, farm management group. Grant Gardner is brand new. He just started uh, uh, the 1st of January. I guess the third was actually his official day. <clears throat> and he's going to be working with um, store grain economics. Okay? So, you know, what, what you can afford to build or not. Uh, in last summer, uh, one of the farm business analysis, uh, they have they reported report a newsletter. And you can, this is available online on their website. <clears throat> but it compared um, the returns to grain farming. <laughs> Uh, across the belt in the, this is primarily in the Green River area where they work. The two ladies that put this report together, Lauren uh, is in Henderson and then Susie is in Owensboro. But there's a similar, they have a counterpart in, El in Elizabethtown. I think uh, uh, Hannah Harden, no, it's Harden is her last name. Thank you. It, has she been up? So, yeah, I know she works in this area. <clears throat> so, uh, that information is available, and I'll, I'll, that's my last plug, I guess, other than to show that there's a lot of resources out there. I did bring one with me <clears throat> today that's uh, published in 2018, a uh, handbook on grain handling, drying, and storage. I worked with some other engineers to put that together uh, that are from some of these universities you see here. But um, it, um, it's the latest. It's, it's used widely in... Uh, Ag engineering technology programs as a textbook. So that's a good resource for you. <clears throat> and again, there's others out there. But um, I do thank you. I know I'm a little long on time, but I um, apologize for that. If you have any questions, I'll be around through the lunch and uh, give a shout out to our cats. They did win last night. So, so. I don't get, <laughs> in the western part of the state, I don't get as much of a, there's a lot of Murray State fans out there, <laughs> more so than Kentucky fans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. David. Oh, it is. Absolutely. And I know in this area where you have a long haul, uh, that becomes really uh, high on the list as far as good reasons to have storage on the farm. Absolutely. And to... Um, and, and to ride out those harvest price lows. Take advantage of that, too. So, um, that's why I wanted to point to the farm analysis group, because they, they've done a lot of good work in helping farmers go through those numbers. 